Hello, my name is Jody Sidornis and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programming here at the Bergen Institute. Welcome to our discussion in partnership with the Quincy Institute on the slander of isolationism, how America became addicted to military intervention and how we can get over it. At the Ragoon Institute, our mission is to develop foundational ideas and shape political, economic, and social institutions for the 21st century. You can learn more about us by visiting our website at www.perguin.org. Today's discussion will cover many of the topics that historian Stephen Warmheim has written about in his latest book, Tomorrow the World. Stephen will be joined by the Bergoon Institute's Vice President of Programs, Nils Gilman. After the discussion, there'll be Q&A, so please make sure to leave your questions in the chat box. Before we begin, we'll hear from Laura Lumpe, CEO of the Quincy Institute, who will share with us some of the amazing work that they're doing over there. Over to you, Laura. As Jody said, I'm Laura Lumpe, the CEO of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. We're a new action-oriented think tank we launched about a year ago. We are working to fundamentally transform US policy uh, away from an over-reliance on military domination and toward aggressive diplomacy. We focus uh, primarily in the Middle East, trying to end the 20 year long global war on terror uh, and prevent uh, a new war uh, with Iran. We're also uh, very focused on trying to head off the emerging Cold War between the US and China. We work in traditional think tank ways, uh, but in addition, we seek to aggressively change the public narrative through a lot of media and comms work. We're really glad to be here and uh, partner with you. And I'll turn it over now to Niels and Stephen. Welcome to a virtual gathering hosted by the Bergruen Institute and the Quincy Institute. I'm Niels Gilman, Vice President for Programs at the Bergruen Institute, and I'm delighted to be in conversation today with Stephen Berheim about his fantastic new book, Tomorrow the World, The Birth of US Global Supremacy. Uh, Stephen's a historian of the United States and the world. He's deputy director of research and policy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, which he co-founded last year. He's also a research scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. Stephen writes uh, about current events from the New York Times and elsewhere. Uh, Prospect Magazine uh, just recently named him one of the world's top 50 thinkers. Um, and this is uh, particularly impressive since he only just finished his PhD in history from Columbia University five years ago. Stephen, welcome. Great to be with you. Thanks so much. So let's dive right in. Um, this is a book uh, that is just published, I think, this week, right, or last week, um, that is about how America gained the ambition to attain and maintain what you refer to as hegemony or primacy or armed supremacy over the rest of the world. Let's start with a definition here. What do you mean when you say supremacy? What's the core belief that animates uh, those who believe in American supremacy? It's almost so obvious because we hear it basically any time we listen to major commentators uh, or political leaders on foreign policy. It is the axiomatic truth or what appears to them to be axiomatic that the United States should be the premier military power in the world should project force around the globe and should do so on something like a permanent basis. Uh, so that is why we have a lot of the world that we see around us, uh, at least 750 US military bases around the globe, uh, commitments by the United States to defend dozens of countries around the world. Okay, so uh, this book is basically a history of how that ideological and material formation took place. But it's primarily an intellectual history. It's a history of the ideas that led to this, uh, that led to this idea that the US should have supremacy all over the world. But I want to backtrack to where we, you know, in order to understand where that came from, let's backtrack and understand where America was in the earlier years of the Republic. I mean, you could say that, you know, the original promise of America, um, one that arguably goes back to the very founding of the country um, by pilgrims fleeing the terrible sanguinary politics of the old world in the 30 years war and the English Civil War was of a new world free of power politics. Um, what you describe as, uh, you know, uh, desist, desisting from playing the kind of dominating uh, power politics of the old world. And for a long time, um, that idea of keeping apart from the sordid politics of Europe and the rest of the world dominated US foreign relations. Um, during that 19th, long 19th century, how did America 
choose to engage with the world at that time, and particularly with the great powers of Europe? Well, American leaders said they were focused on building a new world domain in which the United States would be very powerful, ideally the most powerful. Uh, and so you see this manifested in all sorts of ways, westward expansion across North America, which you know was described by none other than Thomas Jefferson as the acquisition of an empire of liberty. Uh, so let's be clear, I'm not claiming the United States whatever had some kind of meek ambition for its role in the world. In ideological terms, moreover, uh, the American founders uh, and succeeding generations imagined that the United States would be uh, a city upon a hill and setting at least at a minimum an example to the rest of the world uh, with the intention of seeing the world in some fashion eventually uh, come to model itself on the more enlightened political arrangements that the United States constituted. So there's no shortage of ambition. That's why I find it rather remarkable that for most of American history, I argue from the founding to, 19, to the middle of 1940, a very few Americans of prominence would have told you that the United States should attain global military dominance and play the role that we take almost for granted in our own time. Uh, so even to take something as ambitious as the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, here was a, a proclamation that the New World, the Western Hemisphere, should eventually be rid of European colonization at a time when the United States didn't have the naval power to back up its, uh, its words whatsoever. And the architects of that doctrine knew that. Um, but interestingly, the Monroe Doctrine reciprocally forswore U.S. intervention militarily in Europe, which the United States didn't want to do. It didn't want to get involved in what it viewed as corrupting European power politics. But there was a notion of, you know, we will stay out of a lot of the world where global power was seated at that time. Uh, we want a domain for our own uh, prosperity and security in the new world. So something had to change in order for the United States to make a leap, uh, both ideologically and materially, from seeking hegemony in the uh, North American continent and the Western Hemisphere uh, to the entire world. And that was not just an obvious linear process. Um, it you know, might have happened earlier than it did, but it, it didn't for some important reasons. Right, so you say, you say that things changed in 1940 and we'll get to 1940 in just a minute, but I wanna, I wanna uh, one of the few things that I, I questioned as I read the book was the uh, argument you make in the book that 1940 and World War II represents a really sharp rupture. Um, and, and I don't disagree that like certainly US ambition- That's a big thing to question, Nils. I mean, that's okay. the key to the argument, okay? No, I, I just wanna, I wanna ask you to nuance it a little bit because I, I definitely sure. agree that World War II and its aftermath and the rise of the Cold War represents a real phase shift in terms of US ambitions. But I just wanna push on you a little bit to talk about a couple of earlier moments um, where uh, the US before World War II did in fact get involved in expeditionary forces overseas. And specifically there's the Spanish American War where we don't just take islands from Spain and the Caribbean, but we you know, go all the way to Asia with an expeditionary force and take over the Philippines and then fight an insurgency there for uh, close to a decade. Uh, so that happens between 1898 and the, you know, towards the end of the first decade of the 20th century. And then of course, you know, just a few years after that, there's World War I, where initially Woodrow Wilson, who's the president at the time, pledges to keep us out of World War I. In fact, he runs for reelection in 1916 on the pledge of keeping the United States out of World War I only to in fact bring the United States into World War I and send nearly a quarter million troops over into the Western front of Europe by the end of 19, uh, by the middle of 1918. So, so there were these previous moments and I wanted you to talk about those moments. What was the vision of internationalism that the United States was engaged in then? 
And why is that vision, why were those not in your mind the breaking points that 1940 and World War II ended up being? That's right. So if I'm teaching you know, a lecture course uh, to cover the turn of the 20th century, what I would be emphasizing is the ambition of the United States internationally. Uh, in 1898, in World War I, the United States um, expanded its ambition and became a fully fledged great power. And that's how a number of uh, presidents and intellectuals saw the United States at that time. Um, however, and, and I wanna just underscore, the United States became a significant colonial power when it acquired the Philippines, not in what I would call the Western hemisphere, as well as Puerto Rico, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a formal colonial power, an empire, there's no debate about it to be had. Um, but in neither the case of the colonial acquisitions of 1898, nor the intervention in World War II, uh, does one find very many political leaders um, calculating that the United States has a vital interest worth going to war over in the balance of power in Eurasia. Um, you know, the, the 1898 turn was about proclaiming U.S. dominance in a Western hemisphere and an expanded Western hemisphere. Uh, but the president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, made explicit that what he saw was the United States exercising international police power over the Western hemisphere uh, in his Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, whereas he saw other colonial powers, Britain, France, uh, even Japan emerging as exercising a similar kind of international police power in their own spheres of influence in which the United States fundamentally had no significant military role to play uh, ex with the exception of the Philippines. Moreover, uh, the tactic of formal colonial rule uh, came to be unpopular in the United States. And even though the United States went on to rule the Philippines for more than four decades, uh, it was pretty clear, even to somebody who admired the British Empire as much as Theodore Roosevelt did, that this was not a tactic that the United States would be repeating in the future. With respect to World War I, um, you know, there was a, an attempt uh, actually in World War II and afterward to read back US actions as having been about um, recognizing a, a US stake in the balance of power in, in Europe. But the actual intervention was not motivated by that. It was, I think, but here I actually agree with the way the Wood Wilson administration presented its, its motives. Uh, it was a kind of traditional defense of neutral rights of international law that prompted uh, the Wilson administration ultimately to intervene in, in 1917 uh, in the war. And indeed, when the Wilson administration looked toward the post-war, one looks in vain to find, you know, you know, blueprints about how the US military was now going to span the globe uh, because it, it had a fundamentally different role to play. Uh, and even though Wilson came out with the League of Nations, he pitched it as a disentangling alliance that would be powered not so much by the routine use of force as by the power of public opinion, which was supposed to transcend power politics and avoid the United States having to go to war again uh, as it had in World War I. Moreover, of course, the Senate refused to uh, accept Wilson's plans and the United States didn't even play uh, a formal role in the League of Nations. So, you know, both in terms of ideology, uh, in terms of maintaining this notion of either avoiding or transcending the system of power politics centered in Europe, and in material terms, in terms of what the US military was tasked with doing, I do not see the quest for global military dominance, uh, not only you know, uh, uh, taking root in the American political system then, but even being proposed by prominent people at that time. Right, so let's get, now we're gonna get to World War II, which I, as I say, totally agree is obviously clearly a, a, a rupture point. But here your argument is actually, I thought, uh, really interesting because I guess the traditional um, 
stereotypical or mythological, maybe you could even say view, is that the decisive moment is Pearl Harbor, right? Um, so the, the United States, you know, the way it's often told is the United States was sort of obviously keeping an eye on what was going on in Europe, but was sort of slumbering. And all of a sudden this surprise attack by the Japanese, which was supposedly totally unanticipated, brought us to make us realize that the oceans were no longer gonna protect us. And that's why we had to take on this more muscular uh, international role. But you argue that the uh, Pearl Harbor merely ratified a set of intellectual uh, and policy transformations, which had actually been in the work for 18 months before then. Um, tell us about what happened 18 months before Pearl Harbor and what the evolution of thinking in the United States was between then and Pearl Harbor. So there was another international event that was incredibly important. And that was the fall of France, uh, the conquest of France completely by Nazi Germany uh, in a span of just six weeks in May and June of 1940. Um, it's not something that has a serious role in American popular memory today. Um, but that is what really surprised, shocked uh, international observers um, because the French had the strongest army at the time. And it heralded that the Nazis uh, were quite possibly going to be, I mean, they were literally dominating Western Europe at that point. And it seemed for many months that uh, Nazi Germany in partnership soon thereafter with Italy, uh, and then a little bit further thereafter by September with Japan, the Axis powers were going to be the dominant powers in Europe and Asia. And this specter of an Axis-led world, at least in Europe and Asia, was something that American foreign policy elites uh, didn't expect, first of all, to happen. And it confronted them with a new reality. Uh, if totalitarian powers dominated Europe and Asia, what did that mean for the United States? It seemed to mean in American nationalist and internationalist terms that a choice had to be made. Either the United States had to maintain its traditional aversion to military entanglements in the old world at the price of losing some of its aspirations to have a world gradually emerging along American lines of being able to have basically liberal American style intercourse, commerce, trade, law around the world. It seemed like you could have one or the other to many Americans. And so that's where we see a really sharp divergence emerge that isn't just uh, or maybe even centrally about whether the United States should enter World War II at that time, but it's really about what role in general should America play in the world? Uh, did it care uh, enough about the fate of Europe and Asia that it should make military commitments uh, to ensure a favorable balance of power in Europe and Asia, which meant completely breaching its aversion to entanglements in, in Europe and Asia. Or, and this was the proposal of the people who eventually gathered under the banner of America First, should it defend the entire Western hemisphere? No isolationism there. That's a very expansive region, obviously, just in military terms, right? Uh, which everyone pretty much agreed that would be sufficient to ensure the territorial security of the United States in North America. It would deny uh, a foothold to any outside power from which they could plausibly invade the United States, right? And it also was pretty good in terms of preserving the prosperity of the American economy, uh, which was quite inward looking, especially after the, the Great Depression. Or was that not enough? Should it go beyond and breach the non-entanglement position? So that's the fissure that opens up. And there's a whole set of uh, American uh, elites who uh, start to plan the shape of things to come. Uh, they actually got going uh, soon after the war in Europe broke out. But after the fall of France, they completely reorient uh, all the plans that they were making. And by the fall of 1940 and into 1941, 
they are coming up with really ambitious schemes by which the United States, now believing that it has a vital stake in the balance of power in Europe and Asia, should become the dominant power and not just, you know, defeat the Axis powers, but play a militarily dominant role in something like the perpetual future. Because if it was possible for uh, the Axis powers to uh, attain dominance, in this instance, it might well happen again, and it'd be better to nip such an attempt in the bud. Right. So uh, you used the, the I word, not internationalism, but isolationism there, Stephen. So I want to get into that particular thing, because it strikes me that this is the central, almost polemical impulse of your book, is to reject the commonly understood binary contrast between internationalism on the one hand and isolationism um, on the other. Um, and let me just try, uh, try something out with you, Stephen. It seems to me like the dominant story that you could say that for American, I mean, to use another I word, interventionists, um, uh, the dominant story that American interventionists today, and really for the last several decades have used, would go something like this. The, this would be the sort of uh, master narrative, right? Um, for the first century plus of the American Republic, um, America basically kept to itself, splendidly separated from the rest of the world by great oceans, focused on taming the huge continent of North America. However, global integration and interdependence um, made maintaining such separation forever impossible. So during the First World War under Wilson's leadership, America began waking up to its growing power and responsibility to the world and intervened to make the world safe for democracy. Unfortunately, after the war, Woodrow Wilson got sick. He wasn't able to push through his institutional plans. America retreated back into isolationism, um, shunning engagement with the awful politics unfolding in the old world, um, naive once again in the faith that our oceanic separations would keep us safe forever. That complacency was shattered uh, with Pearl Harbor, um, after which America stepped up to the plate, never to make the mistake for the second time and established uh, the rules-based international order, by the way, a term that only begins to be used in the 1970s, but establishes right. that rules-based international order rooted in the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions, which together under US leadership has kept peace between the great powers and driven the spread of global prosperity over the last seven decades, right? I think that's, that's more or less the master narrative. Now, your argument in the book is, uh, is that that more or less reads the story totally backward. Um, I mean, you say, and I want to quote you here, you say, this, this story implies that a certain prominent Americans, the internationalists, favored US global supremacy all along, only needing to sweep the rest out of the way. They did not, you say. In the main, self-identified internationalists before World War II sought to make peaceful exchange supplant the reign of force in global affairs. Um, only during the war did internationalism come to be associated with military supremacy, whose architects devised this new pejorative term, isolationism, and redefined internationalism against it. Uh, for that reason, it makes no sense to characterize a group of Americans as advocates of isolationism. Essentially, nobody thought of him or herself as such. So in short, isolationism, um, in your reading, is a myth. Um, so let's start with some specific people. Who were these people who wanted to move America away from what they were now calling internet, uh, sorry, isolationism? So let's take somebody like James Shotwell, okay? Uh, he, here was a, an internationalist uh, par excellence, right? Uh, prior to World War I, converts to be an internationalist positioning himself against isolationism over the course of World War II. Uh, Shotwell thought that it was very much a project of internationalism to promote the Paris Peace Pact of 1928, in which countries um, renounced the use of force as a national policy, as a matter of international law. No teeth behind it, no sanctions, nothing like that. For how American internationalists saw themselves at that time, prior to the invention of the I word, isolationism, in the 1930s and into the 40s, this was 
very much uh, an internationalist project. Uh, here is a way of limiting the use of force around the world through reliance on international law. Uh, and not only did Shotwell, uh, well, not only was he an architect of it, uh, but uh, uh, William Bora, an irreconcilable opponent of the League of Nations, was also a big supporter in the Senate because it didn't involve the United States in a coercive commitment to go to war. From an internationalist perspective, therefore, you know, the League of Nations could look like, uh, with its sanctions provisions, could look like um, a positive thing or a negative thing, the very uh, thing that internationalism should be opposed to because internationalism was supposed to eventually bring peace. Indeed, the very term actually of internationalism was first pioneered by pacifists in the late 19th century. So it always had that kind of connotation uh, of pacifism, which is why the more kind of, as it moved into the mainstream, uh, the more mainstream advocates would say that what we really need to do was find the, the right balance between nationalism and internationalism. So to return to Shotwell, who thinks it's a perfectly good idea to have this toothless pact uh, to outlaw war uh, in the 1920s, uh, he ends up uh, over the uh, uh, course of World War II becoming a post-war planner. Uh, and by 1942, he is sitting in the State Department as one of the now official post-war planners, fearing that a new specter, isolationism, will prevent the United States from projecting power after the war. So, you know, at this point, the war is not even going that well, but he and other planners are really concerned about American public opinion, the American willingness to project power. And that's why Shotwell and others uh, pen one of the first drafts of what becomes the UN Charter. They are looking for a mechanism to convince, first and foremost, the American people to get on board with the US being the policeman of the world, hopefully in tandem with others, after the war. Uh, and they think that harnessing the residents of traditional internationalism and creating a structure whereby all the nations will sit around the table, suggesting that there's a kind of new enlightened cooperative order for the world, that will help convince the American public to get on board. And so this is when we see the narratives of internationalism versus isolationism get crafted in the United States. And they're read back into prior episodes. The, the, the League of Nations becomes comes to be seen as a struggle between the internationalists led by Wilson and the isolationists in the Senate. Um, it just isn't the way anybody thought to um, portray the choice at the time or for several decades thereafter, uh, un until we have the rewriting in World War II. So the master narrative that you're telling has one uh, grain of truth to it. There was a US tradition prior to 1940 of non-entanglement, of trying to stay out politically and militarily from the politics of the old world. That is true, but the United States did basically everything else to try to expand its influence at that time, uh, economically, uh, even territorially and militarily within the Western Hemisphere and expanded Western Hemisphere domain. So you mentioned the United Nations and the architecture of the United Nations. Um, another way in which your book reads against the grain of, I guess, uh, conventional liberal internationalist understandings is, you know, People will acknowledge the United States has, you know, even even the most, uh, you know, apologist person for American power will say, uh, yes, United States, you know, after World War II maintained global ambitions, but you know, unlike previous hegemons, unlike the, unlike Hitler or Stalin or what have you, um, or Napoleon, you know, we encased what we were trying to do in these world organizations, right? Um, but you have a somewhat different reading. Your argument, as I understand it, is that the reason why we pick up the idea of the United Nations is not because we want to create a global parliament of man, but rather because it's only by creating some figment of, uh, you know, institutionalization and broad participation that 
uh, the now pe the people who are styling themselves as internationalists think they're going to be able to sell U.S. long-term uh, supremacist ambitions to an American people whose public opinion, a term that was pretty new at that time, they're concerned will drive people back or drive the country back into a posture of uh, standoffishness from the rest of the world. Is that right? That's right. So if there was a time when American leaders wanted to create a parliament of man, it was through the League of Nations or alternatives that were aired at the end of World War I, where states would commit to um, settle their disputes in an international court, uh, or uh, the League of Nations was conceived as a forum for public opinion to express itself for the kind of harmony that was assumed by uh, some of these internationalists to exist latent in the world would actually uh, be expressed through the halls of the League of Nations and the, the, the assembly, the, the precursor to what we know now as the UN General Assembly uh, had, uh, was, was supposed to have as much power over security matters as the Great Power Council at that time. The United Nations was not the kind of culmination of or outgrowth from the League of Nations vision. Uh, what I show, uh, is, and the sequencing is really important here, uh, is that uh, first in 1941, US planners rejected the League of Nations and any universalist scheme as being completely inadequate to provide for world order in the future. It was precisely because such a scheme had failed that the United States, uh, in tandem perhaps with other great powers, especially the British Empire as of 1941, the United States needed to take the lead and project its military power around the world. So it was precisely because the old style of internationalism had failed that the United States had to become the armed hegemon of the world. Having gone through that transformation, then they asked themselves after Pearl Harbor, okay, how do we actually make this vision happen? And to my surprise, sitting there in the National Archives, uh, reading these documents, there was a kind of moment of decision uh, in 1942 among post-war planners that something that looked like, smelled like the old League of Nations or a, what we'd call today, a rules-based world order had to be created. The point wasn't to actually create rules that could transcend power politics or seriously inhibit the projection of power by the United States. The whole point was to enable the projection of power by the United States. And that is how we get the UN and the UN system. And if you think about it that way, even though we're used to the UN being uh, coming under attack by nationalist forces in the United States, um, you know, if you think about the logic of the architects of the UN, it starts to explain some things uh, about our recent history uh, and US history since 1945. It turns out, you know, the US Congress hasn't declared war since World War II. Part of the reason is that the, when we can go through the United Nations, that provides a, an appearance of legitimacy and legality to a military operation that can substitute for uh, the consent of Congress. So it happened in the Korean War, for example. Um, and uh, in our own time, we've seen, you know, uh, a search for some kind of legitimacy when the Obama administration was looking to strike Syria. Uh, maybe it could get at the UN. No, it couldn't. Maybe it could get it from NATO. Maybe it needed it from Congress and it ultimately got it from nowhere. And the strike did not happen at that time. Great. So this is a good, this is a good pivot. I'd like to spend the last uh, 10 minutes before we open it up to questions by talking a little bit more about the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, which is the, uh, the organization that you founded along with Andy Bacevich and Trita Parsi and Suzanne DiMaggio and Eli Clifton last year. Um, and in the interest of uh, transparency, I should mention that I am myself am a non-resident fellow of the Institute. So it's not like I'm a total neutral party here. Um, before we get into some of the things that you guys are promoting at, at Quincy, um, uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about how what you're doing at Quincy um, 
Well, just what you're doing at Quincy, and then I want to ask you about what the relationship is between the contemporary work you're doing at Quincy and this historical work you've done in this book. So first, tell us a little bit about what Quincy's mission is, and then we can talk a little bit about the relationship to the book. The last thing that I thought was needed was another foreign policy think tank in Washington until I saw the, the terrain of debate changing in this country in a way I hadn't seen in my adult lifetime. Uh, and the mission of the Institute reflects a uh, very different vision of things uh, from other foreign policy entities in Washington. The mission of the Institute is to promote ideas that move US foreign policy away from endless war and toward vigorous diplomacy in the pursuit of peace. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's a transpartisan think tank. We are seeking to harness energies coming from all quarters in this country, right, left, even center, that want a less militaristic US foreign policy uh, in the 21st century. And we're doing all the things that think tanks do, and then some, I would say, in pursuit of that mission. We're not even uh, a year old, coming up on the one year uh, launch date. Uh, but we, uh, you know, we advise Congress. Uh, we uh, have as much input as we can into uh, policy making uh, in administrations, and we're also trying to change the conversation in the public sphere, which is what this book uh, is is part of. Uh, because you know, it's it's not just um, it's not just the sort of DC policy making that's gone wrong, but I think it's the entire. Um, uh, vision of what America can be in the world that has been stifled by precisely what we were just talking about. The notion that, you know, either the United States is militarily dominant or somehow it's isolationist. Either it's doing everything or it's doing nothing. It's just implausible on its face uh, that that are, those are the options for the United States. Uh, and so a point of departure for me is, is to try to open up uh, our conversation so we can uh, find, you know, both a, a better place for the United States in the world in the 21st century and a better way of uh, organizing a more democratic debate that's more meaningful uh, from the really narrow one that uh, seems to take place all the time in Washington, on TV, on op-ed pages, and so forth. Great. So, um, You know, one of the things you say, so let's talk about the relationship of the book to the Institute. I mean, one of the things you say in the book is, and I, I quote you here, for too long, the stewards of global supremacy have been permitted to define the horizons of understandings US foreign policy. Um, unlike other accounts, this book does not adopt the concepts of the victors as if they were neutral descriptors. Um, so let me then ask, uh, Stephen, how do you think a book like this uh, that, that's attempting to dismantle the historical in invention of isolationism as a, as a fiction effectively and as a mythology uh, relate to Quincy's mission. Right. You know, I, I think that, um, so I'm trained as a historian. I conceived of this project before I had any notion that I would be doing actual policy work in Washington as part of a think tank. You know, this is a book that's supposed to send me to get tenure somewhere and I'll continue in that vein for the rest of my life. That was my imagination, you know, when I started on this project at some point in the Obama administration. Um, I don't think that history is a particularly um, good uh, craft to tell us exactly what should be done going forward. I think it is incredibly good in expanding our horizons, however, uh, and showing us uh, what the options clarify, what the options really have been in the future, defamiliarizing ourselves uh, and uh, opening up our imaginative horizons. So that is what I'm trying to achieve in the book. In some sense, the limitations of the book, <laughs> as much as the resources that the book offers, led me into the work with the Quincy Institute because I think we do need a positive sense of exactly what should be done in particular moments. And that's something that history uh, can't, it can kind of urge, get us close to that line, but it can never quite cross the line. So I'm really delighted to be part of that effort 
uh, in the Quincy Institute. But I also have to say, I think some of the analysis of the book is directly relevant. I mean, once you understand um, some of the findings of the book, it really clarifies uh, where we are strategically right now. For example, the fact that even interventionists, even those who favored US entry into World War II and post-war policing understood after the fall of France that what they were proposing really wasn't about the direct security of the United States. It wasn't as though the United States was going to be plausibly attacked in their view. It was about leading a world order, something very hard for even them to concretely define in that time. You know, that's a powerful point in our present day, especially when we do not seem to be facing anything like the totalitarian conquerors uh, that they faced in their own moment in the middle of the 20th century. And you could extend, if you like, the Soviet-backed communism uh, as, as part of that uh, geopolitical and ideological reality. So I do think that some of the findings of the book provide a grounding for understanding what our strategy should be going forward. If you start from that premise, then I think you start to ask, why has the United States, to what end, has it pursued global military dominance for three decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when there simply hasn't been uh, the plausible specter of totalitarian conquest that could attain hegemony in Europe and Asia? Whether you think that's the right benchmark for American security or not, it simply hasn't been a plausible specter for many, many years. And so these actions that the United States undertakes uh, in the name of leading a rules-based order or maintaining its own hegemony start to look like a net loss to American security, something that has created antagonisms uh, rather than actually enhanced American security. So that trajectory helped to get me to a place where uh, with the help of other literature and people as well, I began to see that um, the American American pursuit of global dominance, in my view, has actually made Americans less safe in our own time. And I think that's likely to be the case moving forward unless we change course. Right. Let me let me dig into one of these issues. Um, again, I want to quote you quoting somebody else. Uh, one of the things I was sort of drawn up, uh, startled by in the book, Stephen, is you quote the political scientist uh, John Eikenberry um, of Princeton. He says, when all is said and done, Americans, this is Eikenberry, you quoting him, when all is said and done, Americans are less interested in ruling the world than they are in a world of rules. Um, now, you know, Eikenberry is perhaps the IR scholar, most strongly, current IR scholar, most strongly affiliated with what you might call the liberal internationalist school uh, that to some extent Quincy has set itself up in, co in contrast to, um, which is one reason I was surprised to see you quoting him that way sort of uh, pr approvingly. Um, and Eikenberry's meta argument, as I understand it, is that you know, he takes the constitutional order of international institutions as they advertise themselves to be. Um, right. Sort of assumes that the United States is a reluctant superpower, not interested in dominating others, readily ascending, assenting to institutional constraints of one sort and another. You've already laid out your skepticism of that in general. So the question I have for you then is, Stephen, what do you think the role of transnational organizations should be and how should the United States participate in those kinds of organizations? And I wanna ask a very specific question. Are there specific, what we might call sovereign powers that you think the United States should consider delegating mm -hmm. up or over to those organizations, those kinds of transnational organizations? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I should clarify that uh, my quoting of Eikenberry uh, is not meant to be uh, approving. I, I see my narrative of the creation of uh, the United Nations and other international institutions as being uh, different from his, because I don't think that there can be the kind of separation that he creates between rules uh, and uh, a world of power. Uh, to the extent that rules were valued, uh, it, they were valued by American planners uh, as vehicles for the United States to, to project power. So I do think he's... Uh, He's got it wrong uh, about that. Um, you know, it's um, I, I my view of international institutions is, I think, actually more in line with the actual history of 
U.S. conduct than what we hear from Eikenberry and other defenders of what has very recently come to be called the rules-based U.S.-led liberal international order or some variant, where they attempt to create this story that the United States um, created this uh, single order uh, around 1945, or maybe it began in 1940. They can't quite figure out the details, uh, you know. And then it it marched through time and space, realizing its itself. I mean, you have the the, the conventional wisdom gets so absurd uh, that uh, institutions like the EU or the WTO get backdated. I think by the New York Times uh, uh, to you know the post-war period. Uh, these are creations of our of the 90s, of 2001, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, my view is a pragmatic view that when there are crucial issues uh, that are genuinely compel of the United States to pursue its interests, and those interests align with those of other states, there should be cooperation. And sometimes that cooperation should be uh, undertaken a, a, as, at a, as a formal matter, as a, at the transnational level or the international level. So it seems to me that climate change is exactly that kind of issue where we have, to my mind, uh, one of, if not the foremost threat to the American people where they live and work in the 21st century happens to be also a threat uh, to the planet as a whole, not always evenly, but a threat to everyone. That's an issue where, uh, yes, I'd like to see uh, if it could be done, mu something much more ambitious than say the Paris Agreement, uh, where we can get out of, to, to the extent we can, a zero sum mentality uh, and uh, have resources pulled and perhaps give uh, resources for investments in green technology uh, and uh, climate related disaster relief to the areas of the greatest need. Um, I'm not sure that I'm particularly sanguine. I'm not uh, about the prospects for achieving that, but you know, that's something that I would be enthusiastically willing to try. Uh, certainly I think the United States and China, uh, this is a crucial factor in the bilateral relationship that too often gets sidelined uh, in all the kind of hawkish noises that we hear about China in, in Washington, such that it seems as though we prioritize maintaining perpetual military preeminence uh, in Northeast Asia uh, at the risk, at the risk of getting locked into a Cold War framework that will be the opposite of conducive to the kind of rapid decarbonization and cooperation globally that will be needed to confront what is a genuine threat, in my view, to uh, the interests of the American people. Um, great. I want to ask you a question about China. Uh, I also want to remind the listeners uh, to put any questions you have in the YouTube uh, box. Uh, those will be transmitted to me and I will transmit them on to Stephen in a second. Um, let me um, close out my questions here, Stephen, with a question specifically about China. I, I couldn't agree more that, uh, you know, figuring out how to cooperate with China on climate related issues is, um, arguably the most pressing global issue in the world right now and likely to continue to be uh, you know, for decades to come. Um, near the end of your book, you observe, uh, and again, I wanna quote you, Americans have lost sight, both of the specific circumstances that elicited the decision for primacy and the weighty trade-offs that that primacy entails. And I think you're talking here a moment ago about those kinds of trade-offs. Um, and so I wanna ask you a little bit about what you think, how you think we should balance those trade-offs with China. Um, and before I ask you a specific question, I, I want to sort of give you my kind of reading about how American attitudes have changed and evolved towards China over the last couple of decades. You know, if you look at the 1990s, this was the moment of the end of history from Francis Fukuyama. The idea was understood that there was, people were confident that there would be, you know, convergence. Uh, and that economic liberalization in China would really nilly lead to political liberalization. As, as a rising middle class emerged in China, it would demand political rights as it happened in Eastern Europe and as it happened in Latin America. And that there would be another, you know, eventually China would be overtaken by what was then being called the third wave of democratization. Now, I think already by 
20 years ago with the Bush administration, people became beginning to be pretty skeptical about that. Um, and you know, that skepticism, I think, continued to grow under the Obama years. But during those years, partly because the US was very fixated on the war on terror and was not really paying that much attention to China, um, most of the efforts were to you know, contain China within the rules-based framework, right? I mean, there was this famous line that China should become a responsible stakeholder, right? Um, and that the idea, the, the way we would make them become responsible stakeholders was by including them in this architecture of international institutions. Um, I think it's fair to say that under Trump, um, that's to all changed pretty dramatically um, along at least two different axes. Uh, the first axis would be that, you know, Trump has obviously taken a much harder rhetorical turn against the Chinese than Obama did or Bush did, certainly than Clinton. Um, you know, China is increasingly seen as maybe a rival or a competitor, if not an enemy. Um, a view that I should also say is reinforced by the hardline turn that China has taken under President Xi. Um, and second, just as importantly, Trump has totally skewed the whole idea of a rules-based, allies-based, alliance-based approach to trying to address the challenge uh, of a rising China. He's trashed the WTO, he's trashed the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Obama had negotiated, he's preferred to do unilateral tariffs. Um, but at the same time, you know, he has avoided, being quite careful, I would say, to avoid direct military confrontation with the Chinese. Um, but it's a really hard trade-off because there's no question the Chinese are increasingly aggressive about pursuing their interests as they understand them over the last few years. So I guess I'll just ask a broad open-ended question. What do you think the basic view, uh, what is Quincy's view or your views personally, Stephen, about what should be done about China's increasingly aggressive attitude, especially in light of the fact that we do want to keep some kind of dialogue open with them to be able to negotiate on China and I would argue on other issues of mutual interest, like preventing the weaponization of, you know, AI and so on and so forth. So how, how would you characterize what the right balancing act is there? So I will uh, certainly uh, uh, take up your invitation to give you my view rather than Quincy's view. Uh, you know, I am not sanguine about the trajectory of China uh, and Chinese international behavior. It has indeed gotten a lot more troubling in the past a decade or so. Uh, and I'll also add to that, that one never knows um, what the acquisition of further power will do to change uh, a country's behavior in the future. So this is, and to this extent, the shift over the past several decades is rational. Uh, this is truly uh, a significant security issue as well as a whole lot of other things. Uh, bound up into it, that does demand uh, real attention by the United States. That said, I would disaggregate some of the challenges that we see from China. Um, it's kind of conventional wisdom uh, in maybe democratic circles or centrist circles to say, oh, well, the challenge with China isn't primarily a military challenge. It's this, this it's technological, it's economic, et cetera. And yet nobody actually wants to ask then why in that case is the United States spending so much effort to undertake freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, uh, to talk about how the US must maintain military preeminence in that region as well as globally. Uh, it seems to me we should actually make good on that rhetorical uh, point uh, and think about pulling back, even as we do more to contest some of the genuinely troubling actions and aggressive actions China has undertaken, like international economic coercion. Weirdly enough, doesn't doesn't get enough attention. Um, instead, it's these you know Chinese disputes in the South China Sea that don't mean all that much for the United States, especially because China is not actually threatening commercial shipping, which it has very little reason to possibly do in that region. So something is out of whack in our own calculus about China. Uh, and precisely because some of China's behaviors are troubling, uh, that actually makes our strategic problem worse, as you alluded to in the way the Trump administration has failed to, has kind of given us a get tough, all encompassing get tough posture with China without doing it in 
any way that could possibly be described as, as strategic. So when it comes to the specifically military part of things, I think we have a great opportunity to reassure China that we are not trying to contain its power. We are not trying to get into World War III. Uh, we will pursue a gradual retrenchment of our military positions in the Indo-Pacific, working with our partners and allies to step up if they think the threat from China is so significant, and it certainly is a greater threat to them than it is to the United States across the Pacific Ocean, uh, they should respond accordingly. Uh, but I really worry that the United States, if it continues on its current course, and even if it gets a little bit more nuanced about its, its the relationship with China uh, and pursues cooperation on some areas, is nevertheless going to insist on putting the United States on the front lines uh, in every dispute with China. And so I worry about the potential for a real clash, uh, not in the short term so much, but in the medium to long term. Right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a couple of questions from the audience, Stephen. Um, the first question is, uh, is, is a, a, a historical one. Um, you know, your book is primarily, uh, you know, as you say quite explicitly, an intellectual history. Um, but uh, the question is, are there, um, what are the material circumstances that also help drive the change? You know, are there technological shocks? Um, you know, obviously World War I, a whole series of technological breakthroughs that make a big difference. I would argue that the absolutely enormous breakthrough that uh, forces the US uh, to really think differently after World War II is the is nuclear power, right? This means, you know, with, with bombing and strategic bombing with nuclear power, you're just in a very different strategic environment. We may be on the cusp of a, of a third offset, as they say in military circles now, with a whole new series of weapons that are gonna mean very different kinds of balances of military force in large parts of the world, drones, hypersonic weapons, and so on. How do you think about those things as also driving the change in US strategic posture, uh, both historically in the episodes you're looking at in the 1940s and in the contemporary period? So this is where my intellectual historian sensibility really comes out, because I have a hard time telling a uh, technological determinist story uh, in both of these instances. Um, so with respect to World War II, um, what's really interesting is that um, despite all the talk then and in retrospect about the period that the world had become more interconnected, you know, that the, the, the long range bomber changed the equation. Of course, if we're talking about 1940 and 41, this is a period before nuclear weapons. Despite all that talk, uh, there was another argument by geopolitical thinkers. Uh, that was the preeminent argument before the fall of France, which was that actually the advent of uh, the airplane as an instrument in military technology assisted the defense behind coasts. And as the uh, British held on against the onslaught of the Luftwaffe, there was a real time example of how even just the English Channel uh, allowed uh, the British to defend themselves and not be conquered as uh, France had been conquered by the Nazi war machine. And so if the English Channel could do that, imagine what uh, the Atlantic Ocean could do. So I have a hard time uh, seeing the um, shifts in military technology really being explanatory um, in the uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, and, you know, again, the advent of nuclear weapons uh, could only enhance, you know, this argument that behind its nuclear deterrence, of course, the United States had a nuclear monopoly for some years, uh, the United States could look more invulnerable to a serious attack than ever before. And yet, instead, in that period, the Cold War broke out. Uh, so this is why I think, actually, it's really important to to pay attention to ideas. And I would say the same thing, you know, about uh, the continuation of America's quest for military dominance after the fall of, of the Soviet Union. Um, once the United States is undertaking a lot of interventions in the world, then um, what you're talking about really matters, drones, et cetera. Uh, 
so it's, it matters for how do we extricate ourselves, right, from this situation. But the basic grand strategic imperative, perceived imperative of pursuing armed primacy, I don't think really can be explained by some kind of significant change in uh, technology. In fact, if you're, you know, maybe a true believer in the power of globalization in the 1990s and the information revolution, you might say, well, why does the United States need military uh, supremacy at all? Uh, you know, globalization can do its work uh, and, uh, you know, let neoliberalism reign. And that is a position that one finds uh, in, in some uh, circles that are skeptical of, of armed dominance. So uh, there's a number of questions about how uh, the people are asking in the, in the chat here, Stephen, about, um, you know, what do we do about ongoing conflicts? And I, I like to talk about one of the ones that's gotten a lot of press just in the last month, which is the situation in in uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, the conflict over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, do you think the U.S. played it right? We just stayed out of that, let the, you know, let the local regional uh, powers, namely Turkey and Russia, sort of sort out what the little powers were going to be allowed to do. Is that is, and, and is, if, if you do think that that's basically the way we played it right, do you also think that the U.S. should similarly take a sort of arm's length um, approach to dealing with things like Yemen? Don't supply either side. Um, should we have taken an arm's length approach in Yugoslavia in the 1990s where you know, we're not going to, we're going to do an arms embargo on both sides. You may remember some of the debates on that. I, I want to ask that question broadly, because what do you do about ongoing conflicts when you want to have uh, an amilitarist approach to engagement? So let me just ask that broad question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I basically think that, that yes, um, in general, a posture of neutrality by the United States is what the United States should move toward. Rather than divide the world into friends and enemies, uh, which is what our alliance systems do, uh, we should rediscover the wisdom of neutrality. I am all for the United States using its diplomatic capacity, which has been devastated recently, uh, to help mediate in settlements, especially when U.S. vital interests, things worth going to war over for the United States uh, are not present. Uh, that is a good thing to do. Uh, and the United States is always going to have a certain degree of, of leverage and credibility as a great power. Uh, but, you know, we have to stop getting into this mentality of seeing um, some kind of U.S. stake in every conflict. Uh, in what that does is that it affiliates American power with one side. It leads to perverse incentives that cause actors on the ground to try to uh, make the United States be more active in their support. And it time and again, take the case of Libya, ends up prolonging conflicts. Take the case of Syria, the civil war in Syria, by the way, where the United States, far from not being involved, uh, was significantly involved and played a role in prolonging that conflict and still is. So, you know, that, that, I think we have to sort of move also to a different moral view in which um, our sins of omission, you know, not getting involved to potentially use our power in ways that might possibly stop a conflict. Maybe those are sins and we can talk about them. And I'm more compelled by the case you mentioned, Nils, of of the Balkans in the early 1990s, which we could talk more about. Um, but our sins of omission cannot possibly outrank morally our sins of commission. And yet time and time again, the destructive ways in which the United States uses armed force are totally ignored in our media, in our political system. There's no punishment almost for using military force and directly killing people we did not have to kill. That is extremely profoundly troubling to me as an American. Uh, and take the case in Yemen uh, as a key example. And I am looking forward to the Biden administration fulfilling its pledge uh, to end US support uh, for the war in Yemen. And by all means, use uh, US uh, diplomacy to help resolve the conflict. But 
you know, conflict resolution is fundamentally going to be an issue for the people involved who, after all, always have more of a stake in their own uh, uh, causes than the far away United States does. Great. So, uh, Stephen, I can talk to you about this all day long, uh, but I think we're going to have to wrap up here because we're five past the top of the hour. Um, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Bruin Institute. Um, it's a pleasure uh, doing this. And um, good luck with the book. I'm sure it's going to sell well. And uh, I hope it supports the general mission of the Quincy Institute as it does so. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much. Really appreciate this discussion. Excellent.